started this morning. We're glad you're here with us today at Farmington Baptist Church. Hope you're able to pick up a, a bulletin when you came in. Notice all the announcements. There should be uh, sitting in your pew somewhere, so look around and uh, notice all the things that are going on in the life of our church. Uh, we have started back on Wednesday night, so I had a good crowd this past Wednesday. So remember, Wednesday night Bible study, 7 p.m. Uh, the youth and children are, are meeting as well in the back, trying to uh, be socially distant somewhat, so keep that in mind. Uh, several youth announcements you'll notice and uh, children's announcements uh, on the 14th. They're going to have a uh, activity and then the 21st we're going to go into the uh, corn maze. So uh, keep all those things in mind. Remember the drive-by baby shower for uh, Miss Laura uh, Clifford on Saturday. So that information's in the bulletin. So uh, be sure and remember that as well. So uh, keep in mind all these things. You'll notice Brother Junior's new address. He has not moved. He's not been able to uh, come to services the last several weeks. Uh, and he is, uh, his mail, he's still living in where he used to, but his mail is going to be going, sent to his son's house. So if you'd like to send uh, Brother Junior a, a card, just letting him know you're praying for him or a word of encouragement, you can send it to that address and he'll, he'll get that. I know he'd appreciate that, so uh, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, Keep in mind with the church security, uh, several of you have been helping out. If you'd like to help out on the church security team at 11 o'clock or at the 9 o'clock, we could especially use some people. If you'd like to come early and watch the door at the uh, from 9 to 10, then you could slip back and then come to the 11 o'clock service and, and come in and enjoy the uh, service. But we could uh, use a couple more people to help out. So if you'd like to uh, volunteer on the church security team, uh, you, you uh, say something to uh, Mark or uh, Adam uh, Crawford this morning. So lots of things there in the bulletin. We're glad you're here. We want to sing and worship the Lord. So, Brother Greg, you and the uh, praise team come lead us, brother. All right. Good morning. Good to see you this, uh, this morning. If you would, let's, uh, let's stand up and begin to, uh, to worship this morning in song. Wash away my sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. Jesus for my friends. 
sound good this morning. Appreciate you uh, helping us uh, sing as, as we continue on. I got a good message this morning from Brother Ben, Alicia and her girls, Anna, Kate, and Reese are going to bring the special. And good to have uh, Alicia up here. You know, I know your husband wanted to be up here with us, but yeah, but uh, maybe, maybe next time, okay? All right, let, let's continue on in, in worship this morning. Fall on me, 
everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of the Savior the hope of nations Savior he can move the mountains my God is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Roger Weatherington. Brother Roger, would you lead us, please?
Amen. You've been blessed this morning. We appreciate Alicia and her daughter singing for the Lord. And one of my favorite trios to hear, they do a great job. So we're, we're thankful for that this morning. We're going to be in the book of Romans, Romans chapter number 8 this morning. The book of Romans, Romans chapter number 8, one verse of scripture, verse number 31. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 31. I want to think about this thought today, God is for us. God is for us. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 31. We find in Romans chapter 8 verse 31, Paul speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, What shall we, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be? Against us. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we're, we're thankful for the uh, service we've, we had today, Lord, the 9 o'clock service and now the 11 o'clock. Uh, Father, we're thankful for each one who's been here and, and we pray you'd bless this time of worship, this time of the preaching of the word. Uh, Father, give us insight. May the word of the, the scriptures, Lord, the word of God encourage our hearts today. Father, thank you for each one who's tuning in and watching online now. We pray it would bless them as well. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, God is for 
us. You know, when you read the Bible, uh, you read different scriptures, sometimes the Bible is, is convicting. You'll read a passage of scripture and man, it challenges us uh, to maybe make some changes for the better. To uh, it, it convicts our hearts and sometimes the scripture does that. Sometimes the Bible is instructive. It teaches us truth about Jesus or about the church or uh, about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Bible is instructive. But some of the most favorite passages of Scripture in Romans chapter 8 is one of the great chapters in the Bible. Sometimes the Bible is just encouraging. And I want to tell you, that's what Romans chapter 8 is. It encourages our hearts. I want us to look, you can put your ribbon right here. And I want to encourage you, no matter what you're struggling with, God is for you today. God is for us. Paul gives us a scripture and then uh, he's going to give us multiple reasons. I didn't alliterate, Brother Jamie, but uh, we're going to go through and we're going to see five reasons here uh, that we see why we can know, you can know, that God is for us. God is for you. Let's look at it. Now, first of all, we want to see before we get to the positive, kind of the negative. You notice in verse 31 that it says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Sometimes it feels like we've got people against us, don't we? We, we? we have people against us. The devil is against us. The Bible says Satan, and Satan is real. He's, he's not a symbol of evil. He's not just a figment of imagination. The devil is a real being. And the Bible says that Satan walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We've got the devil against us. The devil wants to attack us. We've got this world. Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. The world hates us. They look down on people like you and I and, and Farnham Baptist Church and the world says, I can't believe. They, they, they believe they're preaching that old obscure book of myths from thousands of years ago. Don't you know the Bible is outdated? Our standards have changed. They, they hate us because of what we believe about, about truth, about moral absolutes, about Jesus, about salvation. The world sometimes, it, it seems like they hate us. The world is often, we see especially this year, everything is turned upside down. And man, the world just keeps getting crazy. Uh, everything that's happening, we've lost so many people. Many of you seen uh, this week the, uh, the, the famous uh, Cardinals pitcher. Some of you may remember listening to uh, Bob Gibson on the radio, passed away. I thought about it just this year. We lost in the same year Charlie Daniels, Joe Diffie, and John Prine. Now, if you don't know who John Prine, he wrote the song Paradise. Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County? Go home and download it after the service. It's a good song. So we lost lots of, uh, of people. Many of you have lost loved ones. Even when it seemed like the world can't get any worse, our president, now it seems like he's doing better, but our president has been in the hospital this week. And we know the Bible says we should pray for presidents. I think everybody, regardless of your political views, can agree we need to be praying for our president. Things are all the time, there's division, hatred. You get on social media and people are attacking each other. It's easy to get down. It's easy and I see so many Christians. I think it's one of the devil's greatest weapons. The devil is always trying to get us depressed and discouraged. Let's just throw in the towel. Let's just quit. I'm just going to give up on everything. Man, we battle discouragement all the time. And I want to tell you, the church dealt with that in the first century. And so what Paul does here in Romans chapter 8, he says, listen, I know you're, you're dealing with things, you're discouraged. But he says, I want to give you some reasons to be encouraged. I want to, you leave here this morning as a child of God, as a Christian, I want you to be encouraged because God is for you. And Paul's going to give us so many reasons. We're just going to look at five of them today. Five Five reasons why if you're a child of God, you can be encouraged today. No matter what happens in politics, no matter what happens on social media, no matter what the devil throws at you in your life, you can be encouraged today. God is for us. How do we know we can be encouraged? Well, look at the reasons. We're just going to go verse by verse. You notice how Paul starts. He's like a machine gun here. Look at verse 32. He says, we know God is for us. Why? Because he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. You see that in verse 32. He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. You know how I know God is for you? He sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Matter of fact, you might want to circle the words in your Bible. Verse 32, do you see that? those two words? For us. He delivered him, delivered Jesus 
for us, for us all. Jesus died on the cross for us, for me, for you. I know God is for you today because Jesus sent his son to die for your sins. I'm going to tell you, we've all got sins. Job said, my sins are many and all of our sins are many. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm going to tell you, there's many things in your life you shouldn't have done that you did and there's a whole lot of things you should have did that you didn't. Every one of us are sinners. What are we going to do about it? Well, I, I'm just going to quit sinning. You can't. Well, I, I, I'm just going to join the church. That won't take care of your sin. Well, I'll just get baptized. Well, the water don't wash away sin. Well, I'll just take the Lord's Supper. That doesn't get rid of your sin. Well, I'll just give some money. You can't give enough. I'll start working. You can't work enough. What are we going to do about our sin? You and I are in a mess. We can't get rid of our sin ourselves. But Jesus says, I am for you. I love you. I care about you. And, and I'm for you so much. I'm going to die on the cross willingly. Not going to... Nobody's going to take my life. I'm going to lay down my life. Jesus said, I'm going to die for my sin and your sin. He died for our sin on the cross. God delivered him up for us all. We know Jesus is for us. God is for us because Jesus died for your sins. And because of that, our sins are gone. They're under the blood. Matter of fact, you notice how the verse goes. Look at the very next verse. Verse 33, Romans chapter 8. Who shall lay anything? To the charge of God's elect. It is God that justifies. In the book of Revelation, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. And one thing Satan loves to do is accuse you and I of sins. The devil sees us sin and the devil runs up to God and he says, look at that person right there. Look at that man. Look at that woman. Look at that teenager. Look at what they just did. They sinned. And when that happens, who can lay anything to the charge of, of God's elect? It's God that justifies. The father looks over and says, I don't see anything. It's been washed away in the blood of Jesus. That's why we sing the songs about the blood. Nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The Father looks over and says, that sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus. It's been washed away. That person, that man, that woman, that teenager has been washed white as snow by the blood of Jesus. Jesus died for our sin. He did something for us we could never do for ourselves. How do I know God is for you? How do I know God cares about you? You can be encouraged because Jesus died on the cross. He didn't die for his own sin. He had no sins. He wasn't forced to die. He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have destroyed the Roman Empire, the Roman army all by himself. But again, he laid down voluntarily, laid down his life so I could be saved and you could be saved. God is for us. Jesus died for us. But keep reading. Keep your ribbon open. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse, uh, the last part of verse 32. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? How do we know God is for us? Well, Jesus died for us. Number two, Jesus meets our needs. He meets our needs. How shall he not freely give us all things? Now this isn't talking about a new Silverado. It ain't talking about a new bass boat or a new gun or something else. It's not talking about wants. It's talking about needs. But sometimes we get in the ditch, don't we? We look and we've got these TV preachers, these health and wealth preachers, and man, they're driving millionaire jets, and, uh, and they're all the time talking about money, and we know that's wrong. But then sometimes we're over here on the other ditch. We never pray for God to meet our needs. And when you go to Matthew chapter 7, you might want to write this in the margin. Matthew 7 verse 10. Jesus says, if you be an evil, if you be in sinful fathers, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts to them that ask Him? Matthew chapter 7 verse 10. God is our Father. And God will meet our needs. When he sees we're going through difficult situations, God meets those needs. Think about all the examples in the Bible. David takes off and he's on the run from King Saul. He has to leave his mama, his daddy, his wife. He has to go out into the wilderness. And he prays in the book of Psalms. And he says, God, I need you. God, I'm all by myself. God, I need your help. God raises up 
an army of mighty men to surround him. God protects him from the Philistines and from King Saul. God meets his needs during those years he's on the run. God protects him and God will do the same thing for you. How shall he not freely give us all things? Again, it's not talking about wants, but it's talking about needs. Well, Brother Ben, I've got some needs in my life God hadn't met. Well, it could be you haven't prayed about it. What's the book of James say? You have not because you ask not. Sometimes we haven't prayed about it. Some of you have got real needs in your life with your family, with your finances, with your health, and you've not prayed about it. Maybe you should start going to the throne of grace. How shall he not freely give us all things? Now I know God's will isn't always our will. Sometimes sin hinders things. Sometimes God is testing us or trying us. But God has promised to meet our needs. You put God to the test. God is for us. How do I know God is for me? How do I know God cares about me? He died on the cross for you. He has promised to meet the needs in your life. Keep reading. Romans chapter 8. Paul's just hammering us. How many reasons we know God is for us? Look at verse number 34. Who is he that condemneth? Romans 8. It is Christ that died. Yea, rather is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us. Where's Jesus at right now? Well, if we could tear the roof off the church and we could see past the sky and see all the way to the portals of glory, we could see heaven right now. The Bible says God is there. And at the right hand of God is Jesus. He sits at the right hand of the Father. Now I know, I don't understand all the Trinity. We believe that God is three, God is one. We believe what the Scripture says. God is right there at the the right hand of, of the Father. And what's He doing? The Bible says He ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's praying for you. Now we know prayer is powerful, isn't it? God answers prayer. I love the story. Some of you have heard it before, but not all of you have. One of my favorite stories, you know, during the Second World War... As the tide turned against the Japanese there in the Pacific, they began to use kamikazes. And that literally means divine wind. And they would send these pilots up in these planes loaded down with bombs and explosives. And they would tell them, you crash your plane into the American ships. And you blow yourself up, blow the plane, you, you try to sink the ships. And these planes, uh, these ships would come and, and they sunk at least 34 American ships hit over 400. The Americans, they would be, their ships they learned and they would be covered with with guns. The Japanese kamikazes, they loved to hit aircraft carriers the, the, the most. And these aircraft carriers, man, they'd have 30 millimeter machine guns or 30 caliber machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns, 20 millimeter cannon, 40 millimeter cannon, all the way up to 5 inch cannons to shoot the kamikazes down. But those planes are coming 400 miles an hour. They're hard to hit. It takes a direct hit with a big gun or a whole bunch of little hits to knock them into the water. One of the boats was the USS Bennington. One of 24 carriers in the Essex class. Biggest ships the Americans had during the Second World War. And on the USS Bennington during the Second World War was Jerry Clyer. This is a true story. Jerry Clyer was on the Bennington and and he later wrote, said, I don't know if it was 44 or 45, he was out there in the Pacific on the Bennington and one day, man, the kamikazes came. And they were coming from all directions. And he said the Marines were on the gun shooting and man, they're shooting in all directions. And he said they're coming and and it looked like they were going to hit and so many sailors got killed from those kamikazes. And they were able, he said, by a miracle, they were able to shoot everyone down. And not one of those kamikazes hit the USS Bennington. Jerry Clyer, he wrote down the date in his his journal. Several weeks went by and he got a letter from his mama. And the letter from his mama said on that very date, the East Fork Baptist Church, East Fork, Mississippi, way down near the Gulf Coast, had a special prayer meeting to pray for Jerry Clyer. That God would protect him in the service. Man, isn't that awesome? God answers prayer. Prayer is powerful. Man, how powerful it is. Many of you can think about when you've had trouble in your life and you ask somebody to pray for you, you asked a family member, a church, a preacher to pray for you, and God answered that prayer. Prayer is powerful. 
How much more so if Jesus is praying for us? Man, that's awesome. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Ever liveth. Jesus at the right hand of the Father and He's praying for us. When He sees you're in temptation, He's praying you'll say no to that temptation. When He sees you've got trouble, He's praying that you'll have the strength to make it through. When He sees you've got needs, He's praying for you. He's ever liveth. He's always there praying for you and I. How do I know that God is for us? How do I, why can you be encouraged? You be encouraged because right now at the right hand of the Father, it, Jesus is right there and He's praying for me and he's praying for you man Paul's encouraged us he says lift up lift up yes look up don't be discouraged God is for us he died on the cross for us he meets our needs he prays for us let me give you two more quickly verse 35 we're secure in the hands of Jesus look at verse 35 who the idea there is literally what shall separate us from the love of God shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. Paul answers the question in verse 35 of Acts 9, or Romans 9, Romans 8. Neither height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The fourth reason we know God is for us, nothing can separate us from God. God loves us and when God saves us, when we get saved by God's grace, we're in the Father's hands and nothing can separate us from God's love. I'm going to tell you, sometimes you may wonder, well, preacher, I, I, I'm not sure I've had a lot happen. Nothing. Matter of fact, you'll notice in these verses, he talks about neither angels nor principalities. Principalities is talking about the devil and his angels, demons. I'm going to tell you, Satan may want to destroy you, but I want to tell you some good news. You're in the hands of Jesus, and Satan can't get to you. Satan can't cause you to lose your salvation. Satan can't do anything to you, matter of fact, without God's permission. Where nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not angels, not principalities. He says, has neither life nor death. When you come to the end of your life as a Christian and, and you're on your deathbed and you're about to breathe your bre uh, last breath, you're in the hands of Jesus and the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We are secure. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You know why I believe in eternal security? Look at the last part there of verse number 30 in Romans 8. He says the last line in Romans 8 verse 30, Those whom He justified, them He also glorified. You notice the Bible does not say those He justified, some of them He glorified. Glorified is talking about we get to heaven and have that new body. It doesn't say part of them, half of them. A quarter of them. It says those he justified, them 100% he glorified. We have eternal security. We are safe and secure in the hands of Jesus. Jesus said of all the Father has given me, I have lost none. Well, preacher, what about Judas? He lost. No, Judas was never saved. He, he never got saved by God's grace. When we're saved, we're in the hands of Jesus, and He never lets us go. We sin, we mess up, He disciplines us, He chastens us, but He never drops us. Just like you, you messed up. Boy, I did things many times that disappointed my mom and dad, just like you did, but they never disowned me. They never kicked me out, and neither did your parents. God loves us if our parents... How much more does the heavenly Father always love His children? God's for us. He's got us in His hands. And nothing can separate us from His love. One more and I'm done. God is for us. He died for us. He meets our needs. He prays for us. We're secure in His hands. In verse 28 of Romans 8, He's got a plan for our lives. and We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. God always has a plan. God always has purpose. Now we don't understand why bad things happen in our life. We don't understand why the Lord's allowing us to go through this year. But God's always got a purpose. You know, it could be Baptist churches, and we don't ever want to change our doctrine. Y'all know I believe that 110%. 
But sometimes we're a little behind the times on things. But because of 2020, nearly every Baptist church in West Kentucky, nearly everyone is on Facebook or YouTube. Even little small churches often are putting their services online. God brought good out of bad. There's more preaching on social media right now than there's ever been. God is like that. God is so awesome, so powerful, so wonderful, so sovereign. God can reach down and when bad things happen, God can say, all right, I'm going to transform that bad. I'm going to bring good out of that bad thing. He does it all the time. I'm sure when Mary was at the foot of the cross, she didn't understand why did her firstborn son that she loved so much, why did he have to suffer and die on that old rugged cross? That was to her a bad thing. But what does God do? God says, I'm going to bring good out of it. And it wasn't good that my son had to suffer. But because of his suffering, countless billions of people can be saved and have their sins forgiven and have a home in heaven when they die. God is like that. God brings good out of bad. I don't know what you've been going through in your life. Some of you have been going through financial struggles. Some of you are going through health difficulties. Some of you got problems in your family. All kinds of troubles. Some of you just you're so depressed with how the world is right now. But I want to tell you, in your life and in general, God can bring good out of that bad. He's a God of purpose. Everything happens for a reason. Sometimes years go by and we look back and we kind of understand it. We may not understand it till we get to heaven. But you can be assured, God loves you. You're in His hands. He cares for you. He's got a plan for your life. And he, He's working all things after His good. He's working all things for His good, eternal good, spiritual good in your life. Don't be discouraged. We can be encouraged today. God is for us. He died for us. He meets our needs. He prays for us. You're secure in His hands. And even though we don't understand every twist and turn, He's got a plan for your life. Now, if you're here and you're not a Christian, it doesn't really apply, does it? Because you first got to be saved. But I want to tell you, Jesus died for you. And if you'll look to Him in faith, if you'll cry out to Jesus, how does a person get saved? We don't become a Christian by going to church or getting baptized. By just being good. Everybody gets saved the same way. Not the same ages. Not the same places. Not the same circumstances. But everybody gets saved the same way. By faith in Jesus. You come to that point where you admit, I'm sin. I'm a sinner. I've done bad things. I've sinned. But I believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for me. And I want him to save me. And you haven't got to go through a preacher or the church. Or, you can go straight to God in prayer. Jesus, save me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, come into my life. I'm trusting you. Jesus, forgive me. I believe. And if you'll cry out to Jesus in faith, you can be saved today. And man, if you've been saved, let people know if you've never told anybody. Tell others. And once you get saved, man, get in a church because the church encourages us. The church isn't a burden. The church is a blessing. Man, it helps us along the way. It prepares us for the week we've got to face and for next to get to next Sunday. If you're saved, you get in a church and you use the talents and gifts you've got to serve the Lord. But if you've never been saved, you cry out to Jesus. You can be saved today. Christian, you that are, you've already been saved. You that are saved. Be encouraged. No matter what's going on in the world or even the circumstances in your life, God is for us. Let's pray.